Welcome everybody to today's Arthur Island Institute seminar. We're well into it now for our 2021 seminar season. This is our second for the year and um, it's great to have you all here joining us. I would like to acknowledge the traditional lands across the country on which we're all meeting today. I'm joining you from Tungarong country. I'd like to pay my respects to traditional owners and elders past and present and welcome and acknowledge any traditional owners or First Nations people with us today. Particularly um, important in these issues around water and cultural water as well, I'm sure. So today, um, huge thanks to Professor Leslie Head. Leslie has um, been incredibly patient and persistent while we uh, resolve a whole lot of tech issues. I don't know what the difficulty is between the University of Melbourne and Delft, but we have finally managed to resolve those issues and bring Leslie to you today to present to us on Australia's mash, mass fish kills as a crisis of modern water. Um, we're well aware that there's all sorts of crises with water happening in New South Wales today. This is a crisis of a different kind and um, we're really grateful to Leslie coming to us today to talk about this issue. We'll um, have a few questions at the end. so pop questions in the chat if you have them on the way through. And um, as I said before, please um, keep yourself mute, keep yourself um, probably with camera off just to avoid the distractions. That would be great. Thanks, Leslie. I'm going to hand over to you. Thanks very much, Fern, and thanks everyone for coming to listen. Uh, this paper is collaborative research with my colleague Sue Jackson from Griffith Uni. I'd like to acknowledge that I'm speaking to you today from Wurundjeri land and the country that we're talking about in this paper is Barkindji country. Two summers ago, a series of fish kills along the Lower Darling River near the town of Menindee caught the attention of Australians and then the world. Hundreds of thousands, if not millions of fish died due to insufficient dissolved oxygen in the water, a result of sustained low flows and blue-green algal blooms. Menindee was brought to broader attention, not only by the distressing sight of dead and suffocating fish, including bony herring, golden and silver perch, and the long-lived Murray cod, but also by the sight of white men shedding tears over them. Things got so bad that authorities relocated the remaining large fish because they were competing with the same pool of diminishing water needed by the town. Although critical human needs, particularly those of the predominantly Aboriginal population of the region, received less public attention. It wasn't long before mostly politicians were blaming nature in the form of severe drought. Federal Water Resources Minister David Littleproud said, the reality is we're in a serious drought and the only silver bullet is rain. Acting Prime Minister Michael McCormack said, that's Australia, that's the weather patterns, the climate of Australia, it's been going on since the year dot. These reactions exemplify Jamie Linton's argument that the antisocial nature of modern water means that nature always takes the blame for water scarcity instead of the particular social and economic configurations through which it's made available to people. In relatively remote Australia, with one of the world's most variable rainfall regimes, it's easy to naturalise water scarcity and downplay the role of social and political processes. However, it was clear that the crisis was an outcome of more than biophysical processes and material conditions. The Academy of Science panel into the fish kills, of which Sue and I were both members, found that while the drought was a contributor, a more significant cause was excess upstream diversion of water for irrigation over the last few decades. This analysis was particularly the work of Richard Kingsford and a couple of his postdocs. If you're interested in the details, you can read about them in the report, which is available on the Academy of Science website. The Darling, of course, is not alone. Most river systems in the Murray-Darling Basin are over allocated, and this overuse has contributed to their degradation. The panel undertook an intense period of fact finding. This included a visit to the site of the fish kills and discussions with key community reps, including Aboriginal traditional owners. The region has a relatively high Aboriginal population and correlated patterns of social and economic disadvantage. 
there is a weak recognition of Aboriginal land and water rights, as Lana Hartwig's recent PhD work shows. Menindi residents drew attention to river management decisions that they'd been complaining about over several years. Some in the community considered themselves easily sacrificed by forces that have systematically dewatered the Darling River at Menindi to satisfy both upstream and downstream demands for water. So we became very aware of the significance of historical circumstances and political choices, but all these details were too complicated to be fully examined in the three weeks we had for the panel. So this paper arose out of our attempt to make sense of what was going on. A devastating social and ecological disaster that's still going on, by the way, diversely framed as a product of drought, climate change on social media, and scientific management or mismanagement by the scientists. We argue that what happened that summer at Menindi was a crisis of modern water and can be understood within the framework of the hydrosocial cycle, as put forward by Jamie Linton and Jessica Buds. I'm going to talk today quite a lot about how water has been conceptualised in recent history. So I should explain that I locate myself in a part of human geography that focuses very much on how nature, environment and their constituent parts are concept conceptualised. Summarised, for example, by leading geographer Noel Castry, who argued there's a continuing need for close analysis of nature talk in any and all realms of society. This makes a difference on the ground. According to how we think about nature, we might want to put a fence around it, create a bureaucracy to look after it, eat it, kill it, and so on. The way we think and talk about water also has material outcomes. Do we build a dam to catch it? Do we create a bureaucracy to measure it and share it out? Do we let it do its thing in the landscape? And so on. Our particular perspective today is a historical one that focuses on the period of European colonisation. But first, a quick bit of geographical context. So a lot of the social and political context we're talking about is <coughs> um, competition between the three main states, New South Wales, Victoria and South Australia, and the initial power of Adelaide as the port at the mouth of the Murray-Darling system. Um, we'll remind ourselves that 90% um, of the water in the system is in the southern temperate uh, systems, the Murray, Murrumbidgee, and only 10% of the water comes from the subtropical systems flowing through arid and semi-arid country. And we'll also uh, illustrate the fact that the lower um, Darling, by which we mean the bit between uh, Menindi and the Murray, has become incorporated for governance purposes into the waters of the Murray rather than the Darling. But I'll come back to all those points. So let me just explain what we mean by the hydrosocial cycle. Modern water is a particular way of knowing, accounting and representing water as external to its social context, an operation of abstraction, reduction and representation that produces H2O and the hydrologic cycle, to quote Linton. Originating in Western Europe and North America, it's part of a knowledge paradigm that by the end of the 20th century had come to dominate the myriad ways to know and relate to water. So there's three main components. The top circle, H2O, refers to water's materiality. This is traditionally understood as the hydrologic cycle. In the context of the Menindi example, we'll show that both the precipitation and evaporation regimes are relevant. Secondly, we've got social power and structures. And as I said, historically, the relevant ones are dominated by competition between the three colonies, New South Wales, Victoria and South Australia, that later became states of Australia, working with various intergovernmental agreements over water. And thirdly, technology and infrastructure includes the technologies of mapping, measuring and modelling and water accounting. So the water in the centre of the diagram, and I'm going to lead us through four, those four different waters there, is the particular discourse, construction, idea or representation of H2O that pertains at any moment of the cycle. A hallmark of modern water 
is its ability to erase Indigenous water relations and ontologies. And our particular water history doesn't do justice to the complexity of hydrosocial relationships maintained by Aboriginal peoples in the basin over tens of thousands of years, particularly those of the Barkindji people who know the Darling River as the Barker. Badger Bates, pictured here, has been a prominent advocate for the Barker for decades. So each of the flows or waters that I'm going to talk about includes a kind of erasure of Indigenous people. So we've got these four main waters or flows, navigation flows, entitlement flows, exchange water and saved water that correspond to overlapping historical phases based on our archival research. So let's go first to navigation flows, which uh, were dominant in the second half of the 19th century. Settlers valued the waters of the Darling and the Murray for their capacity to transport wool and supplies between the New South Wales inland and the southeastern seaboard centres, including the Victorian goldfields, via South Australia. So this navigation required detailed hydrological and hydrographic knowledge of the river waters bringing parts of the basin into relation with one another. South Australia dredged the coast to establish a seaport, thereby capturing the export trade to London. At its peak, there were almost 200 vessels on this great water highway. So clearly, colonial governments would expend considerable effort and expense clearing the river of hazards and improving the navigation flow. There were various attempts to assure navigation through locks and weirs, and to prevent water running to waste to the sea, as one writer in 1884. Let's introduce Hugh McKinney, an Irish-born engineer with experience in Indian irrigation projects who directed the construction of the Burke Weir. McKinney conducted many fundamental studies of New South Wales rivers. He was involved in colonial water policy at the highest levels and served as an expert on various government inquiries. He was also an outspoken advocate for irrigation development. In their report, The Utilisation of the River Darling, 1893, McKinney and Ward envisaged irrigation and navigation working together to the benefit of the region. They called for engineering work, such as locks and weirs, but recommended irrigation development as a means of justifying the cost of construction. Throughout their investigations, McKinney and Ward heard that the, the soil will grow anything, an unvarying testimony that further motivated them to discover the means of bringing this soil and sunshine and water into productive cooperation. Their appraisals reinforced the notion that Australian rivers were indolent and profligate, describing the flow of the Darling on its long and leisurely journey to the ocean, as if for the most part it was either a worthless or wasted effort of nature. If only they could impound, lift, divert or distribute that water over the soil, they could tap the river's creative power and realise its worth. McKinney was the first to establish authentic river gaugings on the Darling and throughout New South Wales, and he compiled the first map to connect all known levels within the state's rivers, a point I'll come back to. So by 1900 or so, the upstream governments, New South Wales and Victoria, had abandoned the Darling as a navigable stream in favour of railway transport, which they were subsidising. This is, if you like, the first abandonment of the Lower Darling. South Australia's negotiating position and the flow of money to its port and capital weakened because possession of the river mouth no longer constituted a geographical advantage. Following a devastating drought in the 1880s and 90s, colonial governments acknowledged the need to share and better manage Murray waters. However, without clear legal principles, Decades of conflict between three highly competitive jurisdictions played out through numerous royal commissions and the convention that led to federation. The interests of all three states were not addressed to their satisfaction until the River Murray Waters Agreement of 1914. So New South Wales and Victoria argued for the preeminence of irrigation in deciding how to manage the flow of the river, while South Australia, for reasons just described, sought to protect navigation flows. The constitution didn't resolve conflict between navigation and irrigation because water remained a matter for state control. So the failure to define the rights of states within the Australian constitution meant that the dispute had to be resolved through negotiation. 
a process requiring knowledge of precisely how much water ran through the entire basin. The 1902 Interstate Royal Commission provided a framework for the 1914 agreement. It relied heavily on engineering expertise to achieve technical control by water measurement and accounting. To determine the water balance of the basin, each state's navigation and irrigation needs, and then calculate a water sharing formula. So let's focus on one particular representation of hydrological knowledge that bolstered powerful political agendas, McKinney's map. This did two things. It's the first representation of the Murray-Darling Basin as a whole, but we want to focus on the second thing, its delineation of effective and ineffective areas. McKinney prepared this map on behalf of the New South Wales Premier. But believing that a map was likely to give a very incorrect impression of the amount of water available because of the distribution of rainfall and largely flat terrain of the basin, he calculated the effective runoff on stream flow, delineated here in this map as the effective and ineffective portions of the catchment. That is, those areas that contributed to discharge and those that didn't. You can see the um, effective portions shaded. In doing so, he affirmed the basin's waters as a resource, but he also showed that more than half the catchment area contributed nothing to discharge and that little of the water flowing through the so-called ineffective areas west of the divide reached the Darling. New South Wales used this map to assert its moral claim to the river, whereas South Australia had no tributaries being comprised entirely of ineffective catchment in these terms. So in McKinney's words, South Australia contributes practically nothing to the ordinary discharge of the Murray and therefore has no moral right on that ground. Not surprisingly, South Australia rejected this argument, stating that water rights do not depend on the locality of the watersheds, either in law or in equity. Returning to Menindee, an unproductive region by this reckoning of water yielding capacity, we can see how this modern understanding of water renders certain regions less valuable than others, and thus more vulnerable to changes in, in stream flow made in the interest of the more powerful. On a number of occasions since, the New South Wales government has manipulated Menindee's hydrosocial cycle to maximise the utility of the waters within its territory while satisfying its political legal commitments to South Australia and Victoria. So it would be a short step from quantifying an abstract unit of water to exchanging it. Within 50 years, governments had coined the term exchange water to describe the water which would flow from the Menindee Lake storage under a commitment to South Australia. This drew Menindee more tightly into the relations of the Murray River system, its disembedded waters becoming defined under law as part of Murray River waters. This should be back to that map. Through the 20th century, water in the basin was governed in a manner consistent with the core features of the state hydraulic paradigm. As governments augmented supplies in the period between 1900 and 1970, water withdrawals from the rivers increased sevenfold. And you can see on this map the, the large dams in the um, upper catchments of a number of the rivers. Large dams were built on the Murray, and by the 1970s, a far-reaching series of dams covered the upper tributaries of the Darling, necessitating weirs downstream at Mungandai, Walgut, Brewarana and Menindee. Significant government investment in irrigation infrastructure granted water agencies the cap capacity to store 103% of annual runoff. As all these diversions grew, South Australia was on constant alert for signals of diminished flow. The massive Snowy Mountains scheme in the 1950s diverted water from the south flowing Snowy and Tooma rivers to the Murrumbidgee and Murray. In South Australia's view, once this water became Murray water, it was subject to the River Murray Waters Agreement. The upstream states disagreed and for three years excluded South Australia from negotiations, prompting it to take out a High Court writ. 
Subsequent negotiation increased South Australia's entitlement flow proportional to the sharing formula of the agreement. South Australia offered a concession. New South Wales and Victoria could take excess water from the Murray and replace it with water from tributaries below Albury. The effect of this amendment and the associated accounting device was to reconfigure flows in the Lower Darling and introduce a kind of offsetting to the basin. New South Wales could meet its commitment to South Australia by limiting irrigation in the Murrumbidgee and the Murray areas, or it could instead use Darling River water. However, increased storage construction in the Darling's upper tributaries in Queensland posed a threat to the latter option. So New South Wales would need more storage capacity in the Lower Darling, and the ephemeral lakes at Menindee were chosen as the storage site. Use of the Menindee lakes for water supply had been on the drawing board since the late 19th century. The lakes ranged up to 25 feet in depth below the level of the surrounding landscape, filling in times of flood, then discharging back to the river as water subsided. Eventually they would dry as water evaporated. In, in addition to providing South Australia's entitlement flow, impetus for the scheme came from the need for a reliable supply for the significant mining town of Broken Hill to the northwest. Residents of Broken Hill relied on Menindee as a recreational site and during the emergencies. Before Broken Hill had its own reservoir, the Darling River provided Broken Hill with water via the railway to Menindee built in 1919. So the lakes were enrolled as basin infrastructure when reconfigured with dams, weirs, levee banks, regulators and other structures in the 1950s in response to the Snowy project. The modifications increased storage by a factor of eight, bringing volumetric capacity to five times that of Sydney Harbour. The chair of the New South Wales Water Conservation and Irrigation Commission observed that the ability to use Menindee water as exchange water will be particularly valuable during periods of drought in the Murray catchment, and it would allow irrigation districts in other parts of the state to grow. While it might be thought of as a precursor to the water savings measures that now dominate debates about river restoration in the basin, this so-called exchange water was not an offset, as we've come to understand the term, since the emergence of market-based conservation instruments. There was no limit on growth of diversions. In fact, sending stored water to South Australia via the Darling actually enabled New South Wales to increase the amount of water diverted for agriculture on the Murray, the Murrumbidgee and the tributaries of the Darn. Nonetheless, scripting water as a transferable unit represented a further step in the abstraction of modern water, this time through an act of spatial abstraction that made water fungible. Knowing it as exchange water denied the place specificity of water. A unit of water in one place could be replaced by a unit of water in another. Through this act of engineering and the enabling knowledges and social structures, the creation of exchange water transformed the Lower Darling from ineffective to effective in McKinney's classification of hydrological productivity. Since the 1970s, New South Wales and the River Murray Commission, later the MDBA, have jointly managed the lakes to produce a constant flow. The high rate of evaporation from Menindee Lakes has meant that these waters are usually preferentially used relative to stored water in the upper Murray catchment storages. Next slide. Which should say saved water. Prompted by excessive extraction and declining water quality, Australian governments reformed water policy in the 1990s. In line with neoliberal ideas, governments set a reform course to restructure property rights, put a price on water and reset the balance between irrigation and environmental use. They separated land and water titles to enable tr trade and committed to legally protecting environmental water, leading to the 2012 Basin Plan, which commenced a wind back of water extractions by about 25%. In 2017, New South Wales proposed to reconfigure the Menindee Lakes as its major contribution to the necessary water savings. New South Wales considered the lake system with its large surface area to volume ratio a promising candidate on the premise that 
evaporative water loss from the Menindee lakes could be reduced and significantly more water could be made available for the environment. The plan is to reduce the surface area of the lakes and draw down water levels more quickly by releasing higher flows from Weir 32, the site of the mass fish kills. This will require various engineering works to get the water to move more quickly through the system and on its way to South Australia. The way we've come to imagine it is that many of these water saving projects on the Murrumbidgee as well as the Darling work on the logic of moving water as quickly as possible. Water hanging around in the landscape, doing whatever it might want or need to do ecologically is seen as inefficient because it's subject to evaporation. If you can move it through quickly, you can count those evaporative savings as environmental water. So there are a whole lot of questions about the ecological impacts of these decisions and the scientific basis of the New South Wales government position is certainly under question. Let's focus for a moment on the politics of evaporation. In this kind of hydrological discourse, evaporation is construed as a loss, a process that transforms water into a material in a place or time of no immediate use to humans. However, as Linton contends, it's not a loss to the hydrosphere, to non-human nature or to the hydrologic cycle. It may be considered a loss only by those for whom the available water flowing in rivers, stored in lakes or held in aquifers is what really counts. In other words, those for whom water is a resource. The business case for the Broken Hill Pipeline depicts evaporation as a water consuming subject that deserves to be governed by the same norms of efficiency as water customers. This form of accounting compares evaporation's use of water unfavourably to the reasonable water consumption patterns of the local population. So to quote the New South Wales DPI, the primary consumer of water in the Menindee Lakes is evaporation with an average of 420 gigalitres lost every year due to the dry, hot and windy conditions. So the atmosphere of the Lower Darling is now construed as a waster of water, much like the flooding regimes of Australian rivers. The region has gone from being non-effective for not capturing enough water in the Kinney's schema to defective because it lets too much go, according to the logic of accounting for water savings and losses. So let me try and summarise here. We've shown the dynamic of the hydrosocial <coughs> cycle over four historical phases, which I've summarised very crudely, but you can explore in the paper and I'll give you the reference at the end, revealing the embedding of modern water in the Murray-Darling Basin. The phases are driven by conceptual abstraction and commensuration, from unimpeded navigation flows to entitlement flows based on complicated formulae and the morality of catchment productivity, to exchange flows that make water fungible and conceptually amenable to marketing and offsetting, and finally, to saved water where the fungibility encompasses the atmosphere. This conceptual abstraction has led in turn to the material abstraction of water from the Lower Darling, rendering the river and its communities vulnerable. Although the success of abstraction is not complete and in many respects is a demonstrable failure, few scholars have explicitly identified modern ways of knowing, representing and relating to water as a source of alienation from and destruction of the region's waterways. In the process, we've revealed three previously unidentified social processes that help understand the current state of crisis in the basin. First, we've shown how colonial era hydrological expertise supported political imperatives to fix the basin as a unified whole. Uh, historical geographer Joe Powell did some of this work, but he focused on the territorial land base or unit that could sustain irrigation. No one's critically examined the notion of hydrological productivity that lay at the heart of the early um, water accounting processes, the effective and ineffective device that rendered the Lower Darling vulnerable. Second, we've shown an early form of offsetting in exchange water, whereby the Menindee Lake storage was used in preference to the waters of the Murray to fulfil New South Wales' obligations to South Australia. The timing of this discursive shift towards conceptualising water as fungible and the technological regimes that made commensuration possible is particularly interesting. 
It occurred in the middle of the state paradigm, at least three decades before market environmentalism took hold in Australia. In the case of exchange water, the transfer was between governments and not individuals and under intergovernmental agreement, not private contract. But it was institutionalised many years before markets were introduced. So although it may be tempting to characterise the recent water savings projects as an offspring of the, t the turn in environmental policy toward offsetting, what we have shown is a deeper cultural heritage tied to modern ways of understanding and relating to water. And third, we've identified a politics of evaporation in various attempts to exclude evaporated water from the hydrologic cycle by casting it as a loss or alternatively as saved water. Evaporation is more than a site of technical management, it's also a site of politics and contestation. So together over time, these hydrosocial processes have systematically dewatered the lower darling from both upstream and downstream. Modern water is in crisis because of its attempts to separate and remove the social from water, both earlier than previously thought and continuing into the present. Although there has been rain in some areas, the crisis is not over and related crises are popping up all over the country. People are increasingly reliant on bottled water for drinking water in remote areas. But we also see resistance. Resistance to the abstractive practices of modern water is evident in the actions of the Menindee community. The dead fish in the Lower Darling have brought increased attention to the complex relations between water, ecology and society. Having been rendered invisible through much of settler colonial history, the Barkindji have recently taken the lead in questioning the ontological politics of water. Local communities and others continue to contest vigorously the hydrological knowledge and economic logics upon which water agencies base their assessments and management decisions. The 2019 South Australian Royal Commission cast significant doubt on the legality of the environmental offsetting proposed at Menindee. And of course, I haven't even mentioned climate change, which is intensifying all the pressures we've just discussed. This is a crisis that demands more than technical fixes or ramped up efficiencies. Rather, it demands of us a new engagement with the social life of water. Thank you very much. And next and final slide, Andy, should be acknowledgement. Oh my goodness, Leslie, I'm applauding here. Thank you. <laughs> That's very weird to have no um, crowd. <laughs> thank you for that. Um, Leslie, thank you so much for an extraordinary talk. Um, it, I can't say that I'm um, inspired by it. I am deeply saddened <laughs> by your messages. It's um, a really insightful and really helpful capture of the history of what has happened with managing water in the basin and my deep thanks to you for that. It's incredibly important and there's so many layers to what you've just told us. Um, I'm going to encourage people to put questions in the chat, but while they're doing that, I, I have one myself. And you did have a slide there about what next, but I, I'm curious to know your thoughts on the possibility for the future. Like I'm, I'm really um, yeah, it's really uncomfortable to hear that moral and political interpretation of natural phases of the water cycle. And I'm wondering what what is the is there hope for a multi-dimensional approach to water? Is there hope of a, um, a society in which we can truly integrate diverse ways of knowing water and diverse ways of um, living with and in and amongst water? And you made reference there to the Bakunji being key in this, but what can we do? What what are the what are the ways in which a hope for um, a more um, multi-dimensional and appropriate way of looking at water can be effected? Do you have some suggestions? About that? Well, uh, well, we're going to have to do this, or we'll all be completely stuffed <laughs> if we look at the climate change projections for the basin you know the um the ghana report for example has a you know 50 percent reduction in uh irrigated agriculture by 2050 so so 
we have, even though it seems impossible, we have this incredibly strong imperative to um, to find better ways of of relating to water. And I think the um, there's a number of important um, indigenous engagements throughout the basin which provide a whole range of um, different ways of thinking about and and using water and these are um are ones that are very much rooted in the the realities of the present situation so they're ones that um a lot of people can engage with so for example um out at Nimikaira on the the Murrumbidgee there's huge areas of uh restoration of wetlands that are taking place at, with um, partnerships between Indigenous communities and others. I think also um, there are many diverse experiments happening in the agricultural space. So part of looking at the, the social and cultural and political uh, processes is to, is to name what's happening, to identify and catalogue alternative experiments. And many of those are culturally diverse in, even though they're part of the settler culture, they're a much more multicultural part of the, the settler culture. So if we look at many of the things happening around Mildura, for example. Um, so yeah, we have no alternative but to, to be hopeful. And you know, the whole thing's a big experiment. So a lot of these different smaller scale experiments will be important, including the ones that fail. We're going to have to learn a lot from failure, I think. But yeah, it's a very emotional um, story and we need to acknowledge the emotional dimensions of, of trying to engage with it as well. Leslie, there's a question in the chat about um, the impacts of timber harvesting on water in the water cycle and on catchments. And I think that sort of points to, you know, the, the fact that there are many, many voices and interests in this debate. How, how do we effectively bring together the multiple interests and perspectives on this? Um, we've talked about the need to, you know, integrate pastoralists, indigenous voices, um, how do we effectively consider the multiple demands and values and interactions with water in a way that helps us move in a more positive direction? Um, and obviously, if you're in different types of catchments, different combinations of, of um, issues are going to be the more significant ones though in some of the um, more forested catchments issues around timber harvesting will be um, much more influential than irrigated agriculture or pastoralism or whatever. Um, I think one thing to bring to the table is is a consciousness that um, everybody brings these cultural and social and political perspectives. So we often think, and you see this in some of the debate around um, the MDB, that it's only the indigenous communities that have culture. They're the only ones who um, are entitled to cultural flows. And the, the settler mainstream can consider itself to be so much the norm that the cultural underpinnings of our society are not named or articulated. So I think an important first step is to understand the things that we all bring to the table and the assumptions that uh, underpin it. Um, but yeah, there's no easy answer to negotiating any of these any of these issues. And I think uh, if we look at the climate change projections again, looking forward several decades, we're going to have to have a very different notion of value. I think the economic value of certain activities is going to become less important than um, the value for food security, uh, the value for well-being in place, 
Um, so there's a lot of social science research going on on different types of valuing and valuation. Um, so that will be an important contributor to to rethinking those multiple needs. Indeed, that um, values work is applying in all kinds of contexts uh, now. Yes, absolutely. We've got a question from Jared. Um, Jared says, hi, Leslie. Given the Productivity Commission's, sorry, this is Jared Lyon from AI. Given the Productivity Commission's recent report has largely found that the current way of doing business in the basin is working okay, is there a real chance that anything will change? Well, there are a range of views about that, and I don't think my view is particularly um, better founded than anybody else's. It is hard to see significant change happening. Um, but as we said, these we're going to have to change and we want to do it um, sooner rather than later in terms of dealing with uh, the climate change projections. Um, yeah, I don't have a more hopeful story than anyone else. I'm sorry. Um, but... It's up to all of us, hey? <laughs> <laughs> I think one of the most important things we can do uh, is also kind of catalogue these, the range of experiments, most of which are quite small and local, of people doing things differently and trying different things. When you scale up all those different local um, uh, examples, you get a different view of political possibility than if you just assume that um, capitalist industrial agriculture is going to roll on unimpeded and unstoppably. I think the um, we have no alternative really but to you know try and um, bring to light the the range of different possibilities. But yeah it's hard. I think it, it it takes that stepping back that you've helped us with today by looking at you know a, a wider history lens than many of us have that reminds us that the current way of doing things is just a moment in history and there will be a different history that comes after us so we shouldn't assume that how things are today or how they're going to be tomorrow so i think that uh, historical lens is really helpful megan judd has a question leslie um she says I agree we need to incorporate social and cultural values in water management. But do you think we may get to a point where we manage for human needs rather than environmental needs and end up managing for supply of chicken nuggets rather than species diversity? Yeah, thanks. That's an important question. And um, what, what I'm saying shouldn't be taken to, to downplay the importance of of what's referred to as environmental water or to downplay the importance of, of ecological processes and protecting um, biodiversity. But I guess what I would also say is that um, the, the stuff we call environmental water is just as subject to these political processes as what we might think of as social or cultural water. So it's it's partly this separation into the different categories that I'm contesting. So, so yes, it's very important that um, the environment is is seen as a major important stakeholder in the in the whole basin. I'm, I'm certainly not arguing against that, but we need to. That's not something that's unfiltered through social and political processes, and we need to be really conscious of what those are. Yes, and mindful that the environment does not exclude people. No. Many social and cultural values will be environmental ones. Um, Andy's put in the chat, please fill out our feedback form for today. So please do do that, everybody, before we close up. Um, 
I'm just anticipating, Andy, there's going to be quite a lot of people saying, oh, the tech failed. <laughs> we know that. <laughs> if there's something else that you'd like to share, please let us know. That would be great. Um, more questions. I'm just checking. Any more questions? Leslie, has the, the questions that have arisen in the chat, have any of those triggered you to want to mention something that you didn't get a chance to say in your presentation? Something that you want to elaborate on further or say something more about? Um, well, look, I might just mention I had some discussion with Sue Jackson this morning about um, what what's happening at Menindi, what's the update, given this, this paper was written quite some time ago. Uh, so I could just tell you a little bit about that. And of course, some of this got slowed down by COVID as a lot of things did. But I think the, um, so after the Fishkill report and um, the other reports at that time of the Tennessee report, there was the New South Wales government did undertake to increase their consultation with the local community and there was some delay to the um, the project at Menindi. There's still an investigation um, going on, I understand, but it has struck some major opposition from, from locals, both Indigenous and non-Indigenous, some of whom have abandoned um, consultations. So even though there's been rain in a lot of parts of the country, it's still been very dry in the, the region and um, significant algal bloom risk continues but um and i guess it remains to be seen whether the the current um rain uh changes any of this for the time being although from what i understand of where the current rain is most of it's on the the um the eastern side of the divide so possibly not much of it's going down the darling but you know these are long-term issues that are not overcome by any particular drought or any particular flood. Leslie, we've had a couple more questions pop up while you've been sharing that update. Thank you. That's helpful. We've got one that says in, in wildlife conservation, the balance between human interest and animal conservation has been improved by ecotourism. Is there an opportunity for a similar attempt with water? In the Murray. I think ecotourism has got a lot of potential, particularly as um, you know the whole COVID situation is maybe reorienting many Australians to to think of going to rural areas, many urban Australians to think of going to rural areas when they might have gone overseas, and many. Indigenous and other communities are involved in ecotourism. I think, um, so I do think it's got a lot of potential, but um, we shouldn't, uh, we have to come to terms with the fact that ecotourism is going to present um, tours of damaged landscapes as well as pristine and beautiful ones. Often we think of ecotourism as um, you know, just looking at the the jewels that are left, if you like, we we need to probably broaden our thinking about ecotourism to look at um, environmental restoration and repair, and you know, looking at at some of the things that have gone wrong, um, as well as just beautiful places. Perhaps there's an opportunity there for ecotourism to actually build water literacy and a whole lot of other forms of environmental literacy amongst the people who visit. Yeah, I think that's um, that's highly likely. Um, considering, you know, if you think of your average urban, um, I shouldn't say average, but many people who live in cities have got no real um, conception of the, the huge variability in those arid and semi-arid river systems. Or even their sense of where the river that they live on goes. I mean, there are people in the Murray-Darling Basin who don't know that they are in the Murray-Darling Basin. 
there's a lot that um, there's a lot that could be shared and learned through various forms of story. I think that might help us progress this and have a more informed population. There is a question there about education. Um, education in a range of ways, you know, could could be useful to help people understand the whole systems. I'm mindful that we're coming up for two o'clock and I'd like to thank everybody for joining in today. It's been a really tremendous talk, Leslie, uh, sobering and perhaps dispiriting, but um, also helping us understand the ways that we might progress into the future to better manage water in the Murray-Darling Basin, not just water, but also culture and a whole lot of other things and understand the connectivity between different aspects of place and water and communities. So I'd like to thank you very much. Perhaps Andy, if you could just slip to the last slide again so people can check for those um, references again if they'd like to look them up. I'd like to thank Leslie deeply for your time today and for persisting with all of the frustrations on the tech. Thank you so much. Thank you to everybody who came along and joined in and listened and asked questions. I hope that you'll continue to have conversations about water in your own networks and um, keep this conversation going. And please fill out Andy's feedback form and um, join us for our next ARI seminar. And keep these conversations happening. Thank you so much. Thanks, Leslie. Thank you. Thanks for listening, Bye -bye. everyone. See you next time.